Okay, let's call to order the Village of Riverside Planning and Zoning Commission of July 24th, 2019. Director Rapp, please call, uh, do the roll call. Chairperson Mateo. I am here. Commissioner May. Here. Commissioner Hennigan. Here. Uh, Commissioner Marhol. Here. Commissioner Miller. Here. And Commissioner Pelletier. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Do I have a, a motion to approve the minutes of the Planning and Zoning Commission regular meeting of June 26, 2019? Thank you. A second? I have a second. Any discussion? All right. Good minute, minutes. Uh, Attorney Morris pointed out, reminded us last month that even if you weren't here, you can, you don't have to abstain from approving the minutes. You might have watched it, but if you trust uh, Director App to make good minutes for the meeting, you can vote to approve them. All in favor? Aye. All right. Any opposed? Okay. Trustee Pollock is here. Would you like to give us a report from the board? Uh, not that I remember. I don't think so. At least not anything that we're not going to touch on tonight already. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for being here. All right, then I'll call to order public hearing PZ 19-01, a zoning ordinance text amendment. Uh, concerning the zoning administrator and zoning administration procedures. Everybody is still present. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. The public hearing is to consider text amendments to Chapter 2, Administration of the Zoning Ordinance in Title 10. These amendments include, but are not limited to, formally designating the Director of Community Development as the Zoning Administrator and clarifying and revising certain zoning ordinance provisions regarding the zoning application and notification process for map and text amendments, variations, special uses, appeals, and site plans. I'll note that the public notice was published in the July 3rd version of the landmark and will be entered into the record as an exhibit. Since the village is the petitioner, we don't need to swear anyone in. Do you wish to testify? Okay. So, Director App, if you prepare your summary. Um, yes, at our last meeting, we had a draft um, text amendment before you uh, trying to do some updates to our administration chapter within the zoning ordinance so that we can, um, so we could update it to do things like designate the director of community development as the zoning administrator rather than the village manager and to clarify <clears throat> um, some certain zoning ordinance provisions uh, specifically related to uh, procedures for text amendments versus the procedures for map amendments or rezonings. Um, and then some other cleanup that would kind of um, make processes more similar <clears throat> and um, between notifications for text amendments, variations, special uses, um, those kinds of things. So we had a discussion at the last meeting and you guys had made some changes and recommendations to some of the language to make it a little bit clearer that we had already um, <clears throat> put together so we've kind of formalized all that and put that together in a formal text amendment that we're having the public hearing on tonight um, as I said before our zoning processes were reviewed back in 2013 and 2014 and there were some changes that happened at that time but most of those kind of focused on the combining of the plan commission and the zoning board of appeals um, and focused on the variation process <clears throat> and the site plan process to try to expedite or streamline the site plan review process and also to make the variation process a little bit um, more modern, I guess, in doing things like notifications by regular mail versus a certified mail, requiring a sign posting in the yard um, for zoning variations. So we're taking some of that language now <clears throat> and trying to apply it to other um, zoning applications because it was really only addressed in, in that section so this kind of expands that out and provides those kind of notification requirements for things like special uses the rezonings and um, special uses rezonings the variations and I think um, that's really about it for posting a sign I don't think we do the signs for text amendments per se <clears throat> so those changes are incorporated in there um, in the draft that you have before you. 
Um, also, one of the things that was brought up at the last meeting was regarding providing an affidavit of mailing. Um, so that since staff takes care of all the mailings of the public notice, public notices to the surrounding neighbors, um, this would provide an affidavit that would be entered as part of the records stating that we did do the mailing on specific dates so we can show that we met the mailing <coughs> requirements for that. Um, so that's been incorporated into the language. Um, The other changes talk about providing a mailing notification for um, rezonings and clarifying that that's a requirement for rezonings, but not necessarily a requirement for tax amendments. So that is kind of clarified in the notification process. Um, requirements for amendments and I think those are the major, the major changes. Am I missing anything, Michael? No? Okay. So you have the draft text amendment before you. It's got the red underlining and strike through so you can see the additional language and the language that is being removed or changed. Um, you have a copy of the public notice and the proof of the publication, the zoning application, and in there I kind of outlined how um, this meets the, the criteria standards that we have in the zoning ordinance for text amendments, which I've also included those standards in the staff report for you so you can um, as you go through it, talk about how it meets those requirements. Now, unlike a variation, a text amendment is not required to meet every single one of these standards. Um, so some of these may not be applicable or things like that, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't approve or rec make a recommendation for the text amendment because it doesn't meet all of the criteria. So just to put that out there, um, and then I'm happy to answer any questions of you, that you have. And I think that's about it on my end. Before we go on, apologies, last month, Mega, the new community development analyst, was here at our first meeting, so welcome, Mega, for those of you who weren't here last month. So if we have suggestions for further edits, we should do that during the open part of the meeting? I would yeah. think so, yes. Okay. Any further questions for Director Abt at this point? Okay. Shall we do page by page again? I don't have a lot. Okay. Okay. Just as a matter of question on page five. The written protest goes to the clerk just as a matter of formality. You were gonna yes, check I, on that? I checked the state state law that goes Great. to the clerk. Thanks. Anybody else? Sorry, I jumped to page five. That was my first one. <laughs> page seven. Under B, um, at a period and a space for the first sentence. Oh. I'm playing copy editor. Yes, you no, are. And then under D, the added text, is that supposed to be there? because it's under B. Yeah, that's odd. I don't believe so. <clears throat> no, that is a duplication. Page eight, I didn't catch this last month, but in number three, it's a lot of ands. Is that the way we want it, or is that just because of the added terms? Yeah, so we could take out that one before date and time, right? And the place, place and comma, purpose. purpose comma, date, and time. Okay. I'm just, that's ridiculously um, picky. Or we could do place, comma, purpose. I'll let you guys decide. And <clears throat> comma, date, comma, and date, time. and time. Yeah. 
he wanted us to be seek brevity. Anything else on page eight? Nine. Same thing for the ands. Uh, on page ten, last paragraph. Same thing for the ands. Any others? Okay. Um, and then just for uh, clarification, page 19, under appeal, the notice is limited to that because it's an appeal. We don't go through the other uh, processes. Correct. Okay. And then my last thing, uh, Director App already knows this, if we can be consistent on capitalizing or not capitalizing planning and zoning commission. And that's all I have. My day job is coming through. Anybody else wish, wish to speak? Yes, I wish to speak. Will you stand and raise your right hand and be sworn in, please? Do you swear that the testimony you are about to give is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? Yes. Thank you. For the record, my name is Steve Campbell and I reside at 372 Fairbank Road in Riverside. I have been involved with zoning issues <clears throat> and municipal process for about 40 years. And a couple of things. As far as the change to make di Director Apt the um, zoning administrator, I would find that to be incorrect from a number of standards. One is that that should reside with the village manager and typically does in all villages. All that it takes to make Director Apt or any other community development director the zoning administrator is a very short letter of authority or appointment that I, the village manager, appoint such and such, the zoning administrator, done. So I don't understand why the code would need to be changed to accomplish the same thing that two or three sentences on a letterhead would do according to the code. In addition, I would offer that I don't know as Director Apt, um, just because of her position and current responsibilities, is the right person to do that because that makes her in charge of the process from the very bottom to the very top and if someone is unhappy with how that process has worked which is would be at director apps authority then the appeal or the complaint would go to her about how she did it that to me doesn't seem to be a very checks and balances type of system um, just on her being appointed because then there's no one else, there's no oversight, there is no check and balance. <clears throat> However, on a process note, which is, has been troubling for many, many of these public hearings related to text amendments, that part of this has to do with the process and the village does not have the legal authority to change the process which sets minimum standards according to state law. And what is more troubling is that the law has not been followed or complied with on any of the text amendment uh, actions that have been before the plan commission. There was, on February 1st, 2018, a special joint meeting of the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees and Planning and Zoning Commission. Now, this was put on by Ma Mr. Mars and Mr. Molina as village attorneys because we had so many new people on the plan commission and the board <coughs> to enlighten them about zoning matters. 
Um, it probably would have been productive should the president and the chair of the commission here have attended that meeting because that might have made some things clearer and we wouldn't have had this problem with process. So <clears throat> this was put on by Mr. Mars. And <clears throat> the troubling thing is, is in this, he actually puts down that the procedures of the PZC on map and text amendments, according to Village Ordinance 10221, that application for amendment is filed with the village clerk and forwarded to the PCC with a request to hold a public hearing. It also goes to the village board. Now, this is very clear. Mr. Mars brought it forward in the seminar, but yet that has not been done for any of the text amendment hearings that have been held in the last number of years. So how can it be presented as being part of the procedure and then it not being followed even once and the village attorney doesn't seem to advise anybody, the plan commission chair seems to be unaware of it, as does the community development director, that the law wasn't complied with. In addition, Mr. Myers brings up here about the text amendment, but it also holds that the village in the code has to make sure that people are noticed and that the notice is set forward in Illinois state law. When a text amendment affects every property in the village, it would seem to me that there would need to be uh, clearly at least notice given to those people in the form of a letter. I'm not saying certified because that would make it pretty pricey, but they are to receive notice under state law in village law. This wasn't done. So, once again, the law of Riverside, as it has existed, and the law of the state of Illinois, has not been complied with. So, unfortunately, every one of those meetings and every action derived from those meetings, I think it's called the poison tree doctrine, are invalid. So think of the time and effort that's been spent to do things that don't qualify under the law as being compliant. In addition, I believe that um, without, with the, some of the things that are proposed to be changed in this new text amendment, that it has to do with the process. And the village of Riverside doesn't have the legal authority to change the process. You can rezone the property, but you cannot change the minimum process required. And it's troubling because all of these things were brought out in this seminar that was held with the attorneys, but yet everybody seems to have forgotten them. So once again, this text amendment and all the others, in reality, have no standing because they were not brought forth in compliance with the law. And I recently, I believe the last meeting, saw you discussing the draft version of this new ordinance. And people were talking about, is an application incomplete? Is it deficient? What about when the application hasn't been filed at all according to the law? How is that right? And then to make that person that's been in charge of each and every one of those processes, the zoning administrator, the person who is supposed to protect the code, who's supposed to make sure that it's followed, not just by us mortals, but by yourself. So overall, I, I see that this is very, very troubling, and everybody seems to accept it as correct and proper process. And when, and when things are inconvenient, well, we're just going to change the code. This is very troubling. And to give, again, anybody, not just Director App, but anybody, all the hats in the process leads to some, some questions of how there could be conflict of interest in that type of authority. I think that there could be some conflicts of interest in other areas of, of this overall process, but we don't have to go that far. Right off the bat, 
these meetings are not in compliance with the law. So it's really, it's very troubling that nobody brings that up. If you have questions about the code, I have our current code as it relates to um, 10 one and the various processes required. And then I have the seminar that was offered in printed form that brings these issues up that you're all ignoring. And the village attorney, it would seem to me that his job is ultimately for the village of Riverside and to make sure that the village is compliant with the law. And that's very troubling also. So there are other issues, there are more details, but I think that these are the big ones that cover the, the real issues and where things are in the process. And it's really, uh, it's troubling. Thank, Thank you. Mr. Campbell. If anyone has any questions, that's not. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions for Director Epp before we vote to close the meeting? Do I have a motion to close the meeting? We hear mm -hmm. the public part of the meeting. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Is there a motion to accept these text amendments with the edits that we went through? To recommend approval. Recommend approval, that's right. It has been a while. Is there a motion to recommend approval of these text amendments? I move that we recommend approval to the board of these text amendments. Okay, is there a second? Second. All right, let's discuss. We have the standards on page two of the memo. In making our recommendation, we should consider the following standards for text amendments. The first one, the extent to which the proposed amendment promotes the public health, safety, comfort, convenience, and general welfare of the village. Anybody have a problem with that one? B, the relative gain to the public as compared to the hardship imposed upon the applicant. I think the process makes things better. The consistency of the proposed amendment with village plans. No conflict there. D, the consistency of the proposed amendment with the intent and general regulations of the zoning ordinance. Whether the proposed amendment corrects an error or omission, adds clarification to existing requirements, or reflects a change in policy. I think it brings our code into alignment with our practice. That the proposed amendment will benefit the residents of the village as a whole and not just the applicant. And the extent to which the proposed use would be in the public interest and would not serve solely the interest of the applicant. Whether the proposed amendment provides a more workable way to achieve the intent and purposes of the zoning ordinance and the village plans. I think it does. The extent to which the proposed amendment creates non-conformities. Anybody think that it would? Okay. And finally, the extent to which the proposed amendment is consistent with the overall structure and organization of the zoning ordinance. Do we feel that the standards have been met for this proposed text amendment? Okay. Any further discussion? All right. Director App, please call the roll. All right. Um, Commissioner Pelletier? Aye. Commissioner Miller? Aye. Commissioner Marhol? Aye. Commissioner May? Aye. Commissioner Hennigan? Aye. Chairperson Mateo? Yes. All right. Motion to approve passes. Thanks, everybody, for that. Next order on our agenda is to is new business, initial discussion of recreational cannabis legislation and possible zoning implications. Director App, are you leading that one? I'll do it. All right. Who are we dancing with? <coughs> um, so at the last board meeting uh, last week, the, the board had an initial discussion about recreational cannabis. I'm sure you guys have all seen a lot of news coverage of the fact that uh, Illinois uh, has approved recreational cannabis 
uh, for for sale use dispensing cultivation uh, effective January 1st next year and uh, so there are the bill itself uh, covers a huge variety of topics it's over 600 pages um, a, a lot of it brand new text uh, and it uh, but, but there are a lot of local impacts obviously uh, with this kind of big sea change in the law and uh, so we put together an FAQ, which we have transmitted to our clients, including Riverside, which is included in your packet, which answers a lot of the common questions uh, concerning this subject. Um, but in terms of local impacts and, and you guys, one of the things that uh, is going to be coming your way is, is a discussion of, of uh, zoning relative to this subject. So um, the initial choice that a municipality needs to make is they're given the option uh, for recreational cannabis in particular, as opposed to medical, to opt out altogether. So a town can say, uh, you know, we understand that people are allowed to use it here and possess it here, but we don't want uh, cannabis business establishments to be located within the community. And uh, so, so that's kind of decision number one. And when we had that initial discussion at the board level last week, uh, the consensus was we're, we're not going to say that right now. We want to look into this further. So um, let's put together some additional information and talk about this further. So that's in the process uh, now for, for their next meeting where they're going to talk um, about possible zoning of, of cannabis business establishments and uh, either at that meeting or a subsequent meeting forward some materials to you guys for, for your input and consideration. Okay, and so some of the, the discussion revolved around possibly putting it in the B1 along Harlem, uh, but there did not seem to be an appetite to have it in the B2 downtown area. Um, and, it, you know, there will be a lot more for the, the board to chew on at this next meeting and, and you guys subsequently, but we wanted to kind of give you the lay of the land and the fact that, uh, it, you know, once we once this comes to you, you know, some of the decisions you'll face are, do, should it be a special use or be a permitted use? So with a special use, if, if a dispensary, for instance, wanted to come here, it would come before you guys uh, to talk about that particular location. So we've put it, we've said generally we're okay with it in the B1, uh, but it's going to come to you guys so you can discuss the, the impacts of having it at that particular location and is that an appropriate space from a parking standpoint from a traffic standpoint from a proximity to to other uses standpoint um, municipalities also have the ability to put uh, distance limitations if they so desire between these uses and and daycares for instance and schools uh, so that's something else that will be kind of kicking around um, and then we also have the ability to regulate kind of the manner in which they do this. So there's there's already pretty heavy regulation from the state uh, perspective in terms of advertising, for instance. So there's a lot of limits on how they can advertise and where they can advertise. Uh, there's some base limitations about hours of operation and how they operate and security and lighting and all those things are already addressed at the state level, but we'll be looking at those a little bit too, to, especially if, if we're doing special uses. It, you know, hey, we, we understand that this may generally be an okay uh, location, but we want to make sure that we're uh, cognizant of the, the proximity to the residential uses or whatever uses are there and limit the hours uh, to a certain certain time. Um, as you do with all kinds of special uses, whether it's a drive through restaurant, uh, uh, car washes, whatever. Um, uh, in terms of other local impacts, there's there's uh, taxation comes into play. That's more of a board issue, but uh, one of the reasons municipalities are interested in these businesses is the ability to place a three percent tax on the sales. Which is, uh, uh, as a non-home rural community, you don't have a lot of of taxation and revenue options, and so this is one that is attractive to non-home rural communities in particular, is the ability to leverage these sales. Um, uh, for your benefit, and, and some of the discussion at the board level centered around the fact that, it, you know, if if we're not allowing it here, it's still going to be on Harlem somewhere, or on Ogden somewhere, et cetera. So, so uh, 
do we necessarily want to forego that tax revenue and that opportunity if, if it's going to be uh, right next door anyways. All right, so um, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to look at the FAQ or if you have any questions. I'm happy to, to answer any that you do have. When you mentioned the B1 commercial district, I assume you're talking about well, B1, you're just talking about commercial and not transitional commercial. Right, yeah, so the, when I was doing the drafting the other day, I was, uh, I was guessing the same thing, that, that we were only be talking about the commercial. And you mentioned the 3% tax. What kind of tax rate does the village get on other things like bottles of whiskey that is oh, we get our things like that? We get our 1% share of the state tax and then we have an additional 1% non-home rule sales tax. So and that's on every, everything? I know I mentioned whiskey. I, is that on every retail good that's sold? Yes. Within, okay, so 2%. Yeah, there's, there's certain things. So pharmaceuticals, for instance, are 1%, and same for medical cannabis. So medical cannabis was only subject to a 1%. Um, but in terms of the recreational cannabis, the, there's huge amounts of tax that the state is going to be placing on it. Yeah, I saw uh, that. Cook the, County got special permission to place uh, an extra tax, whether it's in incorporated or unincorporated Cook County. Uh, so that it's going to be heavily taxed. Yes, and if that 3% tax is collected, I don't know how tax revenues are processed. Does that go to a central location in the state and then it's sent back out to the municipalities? Correct. Yes. So they could decide not to actually give us the 3% for a while. I mean, is it something there, that's There's supposed to be yes. some protection. I, I didn't study that part of it, but okay, it's supposed but to be protected from sweeps that, that okay. the state does sometimes to try to capitalize on their lack of funds. So. Right. But typically they're about a quarter in the rears, I think, with getting us our sales tax. So like when we get sales tax in March, it's usually for the fourth quarter of, you know, 2018. If we, you know, so it's, you know, we don't get it exactly a month after we get it. It seems to be more on like a quarterly basis. So it's a little, it's a little bit in the rears as it gets distributed, but. They're not behind, so normal behind, you know, versus during the recession kind of behind. Where? I've read in the documents you provided, Attorney Mars, that the dispensary hours are 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Is that something that can be? I don't know if any dispensary is interested in our town, but is that something that a uh, local municipality can change, 6 a.m. to I, 10 p.m.? I believe we can, yes. Okay. Sure. Right. Jennifer, did you have a question? Um, I have a few, actually. Um, I didn't notice any regulations pertaining to medical cannabis establishments in the zoning ordinance. Are those prohibited? No. Um, when that law passed, um, we took a look at it, and I think at that time, we determined that looking at our zoning ordinance, in order to make it prohibited, there would need to be a text amendment. Um, so looking at the definition of retail sales establishment, similar to a pharmacy, it would fall under retail sales establishment. So, but within the state regulation for medical cannabis, there are there were regulations specific in there that you could not be within a thousand feet of a school or a daycare, a preschool, an after-school care um, type of facility. So, um, at that time, looking at where different daycares were and where our schools were, that took out a large portion of the village from being able to have a medical dispensary. Primarily, we're looking at that intersection of Ogden and Harlem was the only space at that time that could have had it. Um, so at that time, we actually did have a dispensary apply um, to go into the, not where the um, McNeil building is, but the building next to it that had applied for the rezoning. Um, they actually applied for a license, but they didn't, they didn't get it. So we did not get one at that time. But we didn't um, take any action to specifically prohibit them in our zoning ordinance. So we're not looking at changing that at all? <coughs> we would, I think, look at that as part of this adjustment. And if we wanted to, we could say retail sale establishment does not include recreational or recreational and medical. And we could create either, or we could still say medical would fall, same as like a pharmacy, and recreational would be considered a separate use. Those would be options that we could look at. And then uh, at the village board discussion, uh, did they uh, discuss at all limiting the total number of recreational cannabis establishments? We didn't get that deep in the weeds at that meeting. 
that might be further discussion at the next one. Okay. It was more like they wanted more information. Where could one go? Um, kind of looking at where our where our districts were, if we were to put in proximity to like a similar to the medical cannabis, what does that, that leave for availability? So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and realistically, we, we did talk about the fact that uh, the one distance limitation that is set forth oh, in the okay. state law for, for recreational cannabis dispensaries is 1,500 feet between dispensaries. And so realistically, given the size of the B1, uh, it's not like there would be a, Maybe a big get two. <laughs> so the state <laughs> sort of limited that for us. Yes. <laughs> That's the same thing for recreational, right? Fifteen hundred feet between them. That is the rec that is the recreational. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That's the recreational. Other thoughts, questions? What is the process um, by which we would opt out? It's uh, approval of an ordinance, and once that's uh, of record, you know, it's it's kind of like. Uh, with video gaming, gaming unless you allow it okay. uh, and people make inquiries we just say we've opted out here's our ordinance so it's not by vote there's like, no, like there's a, a referendum yeah like no a referendum. no it's just board action in fact and, and it's reversible too so somebody could opt out and later change their mind uh, or you could opt in and possibly opt out at a later time and the existing dispensaries or other businesses would be grandfathered at that time. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we're talking about it tonight is the board wanted as many public opportunities for discussion mm -hmm. before any action or inaction is taken. And so given the state's uh, limit on uh, proximity to schools and daycares. For well, that's, well, there is no that state was for limit. medical. That's, that's just for medical. medical. I thought I saw that also for dispensaries. Um, that's for signage. So any signage on a dispensary um, is extremely limited if they're within, is it 1,000 or 1,500 oh, feet? Okay. I don't remember. Of any school or playground or daycare. Um, but for an actual dispensary location, the only limitation in the state statute for recreational cannabis is between dispensaries. Okay. So it's kind and of up to the local municipality to decide if there's any sort of um, distance restrictions that we want to put in there. And we have the ability per the state statute to do that. Right. Okay. I misunderstood that. Okay. Yeah, that's something that several people have misunderstood just the way we put them together there. So I'm going to clarify that now. Thank okay. you. And do oh, we a point, if I might? Please go to the podium. Well, well it's just simple. It's where Central School is is going to uh, a, a substantial portion of our downtown anyway. If it's fifteen hundred feet, everything I would think that's west of uh, Long Town certainly won't qualify. And probably a good amount east will be too close also. So that kind of settles that that question. Just making that point is all. That is correct. Between St. Mary's and Central School um, and the Tallgrass Sudbury School, if we want to go with a 1,000 foot or 1,500 foot restriction from any private or public school, um, that would basically self-eliminate the Central Business District from a dispensary if we were to put that type of restriction on locations for dispensaries. Do we currently have any uh, proximity restrictions on beer and alcohol sales? 100 feet from a church. Yeah, which is a state imposed limitation. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Do you know why the state didn't impose the same distance restrictions on recreational as medical? Uh, it do times. Not. It seems odd. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, the, the process of. of Creating this legislation was very kind of chaotic. <laughs> it was introduced and changed and changed again. And you know, the local government sections in particular uh, were rewritten several times almost completely. And so it, it ended up feeling a little random. So does anyone have a, a sense 
uh, Tony Maros or anyone else here, uh, what kind of um, commerce goes through a variety of these places that might be interested in locating? I mean, I know I looked at what are special uses and what are permitted uses, and there's, you know, special uses are drive throughs and things like that. So is there a perception that there's a lot of traffic going through either a lounge or a dispensary? I, I think I have the impression that in places where uh, recreational cannabis has been legal that uh, there have been traffic issues like more especially early on it's more than anticipated uh, it's, or by early on you mean right after establishment of the yeah. yes okay right um, so, so for instance starting January 1st the only the only uh, recreational cannabis establishments will be uh, there's only going to be 67 at most and they're all going to be associated with the existing medical dispensaries because they get the opportunity to open a second site at that time earlier than everybody else. And it could either be companion to their existing site or a totally new, new site. Location. So they, somebody could come to Riverside, for instance, or or whatever. Um, and after that, uh, the and the reason for that is because they already have the infrastructure. They have the relationships with the cultivators and they have been going through this. The state has already vetted them, so they're able to get them up and running quicker. Whereas uh, we won't see other dispensaries coming online probably till mid-year next year. Um, so I think those initial ones will draw a lot of interest and in traffic and everything else. Yeah, it's, it's my understanding that they might not even be allowing applications for new players um, until May of, of 2020. No, so if they're not, if they can't even apply or... to get a license, then that means they wouldn't even be opening probably for a few months, if not longer, after that. So, um, is it first come, first served? I wonder how they're doing that. <laughs> Who gets in the door first? Um, but that seems to me one of the critical issues as to whether it's permitted versus special use is the amount of, I suppose, particularly car traffic, vehicular traffic that mm -hmm. could be drawn by one of these types of facilities. And we only have a suspicion as to what that might be at this point. So, is that right? Mm -hmm. And our understanding that is even with the, the medical marijuana that there was a pretty high demand on, on traffic for those locations when they opened, just since there was, was such a limited number of right. them. I think that's part of it, is that there weren't very many, and so mm -hmm. if there's one, wherever the one around here is in Oak Park, then everyone is going to that right. one location. Exactly. Any other questions? All right. Yeah. Do you have other information for us, Director Act? Um, I think the only other thing I have to mention is that in September, I think I emailed you guys a couple of times about the plan commissioner training that the APA offers at the state conference. So if anybody is interested in that, let me know and I can get you registered. The village will cover your um, registration fee. So let me know if you're interested in going and I can get you registered for that. Um, Commissioner Mahul and Chairperson Mateo both attended in the past um, and I think they thought that it was a, a good experience. So I think they do a pretty good job with their training. And although some things aren't necessarily transferable to Riverside um, with not being kind of a greenfield kind of uh, community, you do have, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff. And they do go through, at least in this one, they, it says that they are is going through kind of like a mock public hearing and those kind of things to kind of walk you through that process. So I think that could be, you know, a good opportunity for, for commissioners if you're interested. So again, let me know. I've budgeted for two people to go. So if you're interested, let me know. <laughs> Cross that off. It's going to be in Evanston this year. So it's going to be at the, I think it's the Orrington up in Evanston. So. Yeah, maybe not the most convenient, but at least not for me. I'm in Aurora, so there's really no good way to get there. <laughs> but it could be a non so. That's, <laughs> That's <not> true. <laughs> and does anyone know if they are unable to make our August 28th meeting? Vacation should be here. Should be here. School's back in session, so I imagine everybody will be here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Motion 
to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys.